So welcome, friends. Again, I'm very happy to have you here. I'm John Father John Deere, and this is another wonderful Beatitude Center Zoom with a very special guest today, my friend, Dr. Ken Budigan. So again, uh, just a few preliminaries. If you'd go ahead and mute yourselves so and stay muted throughout the whole program, but feel free to write any comments, greetings, and questions for Ken in the chat box, which is the little thing at the bottom in the center. Um, Ken, I hope we'll speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have this, about the same amount of time to ask Ken questions. Now, I'm gonna say this several times. We are very blessed to have Ken here. It's the world's in a mess. Ask mm -hmm. Ken a question. Whatever is on your mind, it's a great opportunity to pick his brain. And he, he's a real, real expert. On Monday, Cassandra, the assistant, will send out the recording link to everybody so you can listen to it again. If, by the way, you'd never, if you, for some reason you ever don't get anything like that, you can always write to Cassandra or me at the Beatitude Center. So having said all that, let's all begin with a little prayer. So I invite you to just take a nice deep breath and to relax and to enter into a moment of silence and enter into the presence of the God of peace who loves you very much. And um, let's welcome the nonviolent Jesus here into our circle and ask for all the graces and blessings of peace that we need for ourselves and our loved ones and our poor world. We'll take a little moment of silence and I'll say a prayer. God of peace be with us now as we reflect with our friend Ken on the peacemaking lives and gospel nonviolence of your holy servants, St. Francis and St. Clair, that we too might become people of active peace, make peacemaking and gospel nonviolence and do our part to abolish war and the death penalty and gun violence and racism and greed and poverty and nuclear weapons and environmental destruction and that we too might do our part to welcome a new culture of peace and justice and compassion and nonviolence, that we might all be your holy beatitude people, your beloved sons and daughters, holy peacemakers in Jesus name, amen, amen. So dear friends, I'm gonna introduce Ken, but, and I'm sorry to be a broken record, but if it's possible, please mute yourself and, um, because we can, even Kathy, we can still hear everything, so it should be really quiet. But especially if the phone rings, don't answer the phone, because that's happened before and we can hear your conversation, it doesn't work. What a blessing to have Ken here uh, with us, everybody. It's wonderful to welcome you, Ken. Um, you know, it's so timely to, because we're all sitting and watching in horror as Russia has invaded Ukraine and the, NATO is posturing and all these military threats and the world is facing nuclear war on top of catastrophic climate change and poverty. And I invite us to grieve what's happening in the world and to keep turning to the wisdom of peace, love and nonviolence. Keep turning to the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount that we might place our trust and, and follow the nonviolent Jesus and keep going forward, walking the path of nonviolence and sowing the seeds of peace. Now, obviously, two of the greatest practitioners of gospel nonviolence in all of human history were St. Francis and St. Clair. And that's why it's such a blessing to have Ken here with us. And while the world is going through this insanity of war making, to reflect on these two peacemaking giants by, don't listen to this, Ken, but the person I consider one of the greatest experts on Francis in the world and one of the greatest experts on nonviolence in the world. And um, so as you, I hope you all know, Ken is a professor at DePaul University in Chicago. And he's on the staff of Pace Bene over 30 years. He's an author, brilliant organizer, lecturer, one of the leading strategists of nonviolence in the United States. And um, he's organized three, just to pick three, of the greatest movements in recent decades in our country. 
the Pledge of Resistance in the 1980s against the U.S. invasion of the Nicaragua, the U.S. planned invasion of Nicaragua, the Declaration of Peace in the 2000s against uh, the U.S. war in Iraq, and Campaign Nonviolence, which is a National Week of Action every September against the whole spectrum of violence. Ken has led hundreds of, if not thousands, of nonviolence trainings and is a key leader in the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, working very closely with the Vatican, advocating uh, that the Vatican teach and promote nonviolence. His books include Franciscan Nonviolence, Pilgrimage Through a Burning World, and From Violence to Wholeness. So friends, as we in this difficult time in the world, I invite you into a sacred time, almost a kind of a little retreat afternoon. Uh, and I invite you to return to your breath, really be at peace and to be with God and the nonviolent Jesus and listen to what Ken has to say and really take to heart any of his points that touch you on this kind of a Lenten journey time with Jesus that we all might uh, grow in our peacemaking journey like Francis and Claire. So how about uh, raising your hands and giving a nice round of silent applause to welcome Ken Buttigieg. <laughs> Welcome, Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to reflect with all of you on Francis and Claire and their way of peace and nonviolence. A great shift in the human journey may be at hand. The brutal aggression being visited on the Ukrainian people, but also, of course, the peoples of Myanmar, Yemen, Ethiopia, and many other places, sets before us a stark choice. Will it be a future of accelerating catastrophe or a once and for all turn toward a global culture of practical, durable, and nonviolent peace? With the grim images of destruction flooding in increasingly and incessantly from Ukraine, it's hard to imagine any new course toward enduring peace. We are daily presented with the dilemma of an existing world order where might can overwhelm right based on the whim of a strong man or the trajectory of empire. This is not a new reality. It's as old as civilization itself. But the catastrophic deadliness of this pattern has grown over the past century with the acceleration of militarized technology, information systems, and the myriad impacts of structural injustice. We confront a global culture of violence, what Pope Francis calls a world war in installments. Is there nothing to be done? Are we simply left to face a world upended regularly by the shocks of military aggression, economic dislocation, white supremacist, nationalism, forced migration, and ecological disaster? Maybe, but just maybe, the very extremity of this moment forces open a new way forward. In the wake of past shocks, Humanity has sometimes summoned its energies to imagine an alternative and even to mark out a new way forward. I believe this is what the Jesus movement represented 2000 years ago. And I believe this is what Francis and Claire unleashed in their own time. And I further believe that hope against hope, we all, those of us in this circle and many other people are called by God to help nurture this new way forward today. When Jesus told us to love our enemies, put down our sword, become peacemakers, he was marking out a radically fresh way forward for humanity. It was a new paradigm. Love of enemies is a powerful force as peacemaker Angie O'Gorman declared, by which Jesus meant wanting wholeness and well-being and life for those who may be broken and sick and deadly. It was meant to be a cornerstone of an entirely new way of disarming evil, one which would decrease evil instead of feeding it as violence does. 
In the early church, there was no separate word for nonviolence. There didn't need to be. The words Christian and the way signified what today we call nonviolence. Being Christian meant rejecting violence and loving one another. Being Christian meant taking up the nonviolent life as part of the nonviolent community. Being a follower of Jesus meant all the things that today we recognize as facets of nonviolence, including praying for those who persecute you, performing the works of mercy, returning good for evil, refusing to support war, forgiving and reconciling with one another, especially when we have strayed from the nonviolent path. For the first 300 years, being Christian meant saying no and saying yes, no to violence in all of its dimensions, and yes to the infinite worth and sacred dignity of every person. Nonviolence is the way God calls us to live, responding to evil with an excess of love. Without the theology, spirituality, practice, and universal ethic of nonviolence, the church and the world are impoverished. There is a glaring missing piece of the gospel without it. Without an explicit embrace of Jesus's nonviolence by the church, its place is often taken by theologies of justified violence on the one hand, or abstract and idealized theologies of peace on the other. The great revolution that Francis and Claire ignited in their own time was the rediscovery of this gospel nonviolence as both a practical and transcendent way of being faithful to our nonviolent God. The Brazilian Franciscan Alder Crocoli has written an unpublished manuscript on the causes of peace in St. Francis and St. Clair. In this article, he asks, what is it that made Francis attractive to people in the 13th century? After all, by the time of Francis's death at the age of 44, thousands of Franciscans were found throughout Europe and beyond. You had about 5,000 come to a chapter or an annual meeting five years before Francis died. That's an amazing sociological fact. What was it about that attractiveness? This friar, this Brazilian friar answers this question by saying, I do not believe that all the attractiveness of this figure among his contemporaries is due only to his holiness, godliness, poverty, detachment, or even identification with Jesus Christ. Other saints also live much the same values. Instead, Francis was attractive because he was, quote, dedicated to building an alternative society marked by the common good and achieved by, quote, toiling in every way to build relationships of peace. In other words, Francis was compelling, not just because he looks good in a birdbath, but because he rejected his contemporary culture of violence and injustice and sought a society of peace and goodness achieved by peace and goodness. In other words, through active and liberating nonviolence. Incidentally, this good friar points out that the vision of Francis that he's just laid out here was not emphasized in his own formation as a Franciscan. They would hear occasionally a vague and abstract idea of peace associated with Francis, but they were not taught that this was at the core of his mission and thus at the heart of what it meant to be a Franciscan today. Similarly, we often make a general association of Francis with peace, especially because of the early 20th century prayer known as the Peace Prayer of St. Francis, but we sometimes lose sight of how central peacemaking and what today we call nonviolent action was to both Francis and Claire. Just as we often lose sight of nonviolence as being core to Jesus's way, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that spirituality and ministry of active nonviolence was at the core of Francis and Claire and their faithful movement to transform their own lives and the life of the world. How though did Francis and Claire come to this vision and this new way of life? How did Francis become Francis? How did Claire become Claire? So let's start with St. Francis. Of course, many of us know this story. Uh, Francesco Bernardone was the son of a wealthy merchant who was groomed for a life of money and privilege uh, with his father envisioning Francis functionally becoming one of the power brokers of the city of Assisi. Francis was enamored by the troubadours, the medieval poets, the singers of chivalry, 
which of course, as we look into it, was all about military conquest, the Inquisition and so on. He was known to be the life of the party among his friends. In 1198, there was an uprising between the merchants and the nobility, which led to the destruction of the castle up on the hill called the Roca Maggiore. It is said that Francis as a teenager joined his fellow Assisians in destroying this fortress. This uprising led to the exile of the noble families to the neighboring city of Perugia, a longtime rival of Assisi. A bloody war eventually broke out between Assisi and Perugia in 1202. Done up in gleaming armor and riding into battle on his war horse, vigorous symbols of the family's riches and growing stature, in contrast to most of the Assisi soldiers who had little wealth and were headed into battle on foot, Francis was determined to best the Perusians in the latest round of the growing conflict between the two competing cities. Even more, he was eager to make his mark as a warrior in the heroic tradition of the chivalric uh, medieval knight, entranced by the honor and glory this would bring. Growing up a privileged and pampered youth of the upwardly mobile merchant class, Francis now envisioned taking the next rung up the social ladder through military valor. He and his fellow soldiers crossed the Umbrian Valley below Assisi and engaged the Perusians near the town of Colastrata at the edge of the Tiber River. 2014, I was in Assisi and I wanted to see the battlefield. I asked a taxi driver he'd take me there. He hadn't heard of it because the battlefield is not on the Franciscan Disney tour. It's not on the things that you see when you go to Assisi. And there's probably a reason for that. So he didn't know about it, but we talked about it. He said it was near this uh, bridge, the St. John Bridge that crosses the Tiber that goes on up to, to Perugia. So we figured it out and, and he, drove, uh, he drove me over here. And I just have, I have a few slides for, on this, uh, during this presentation that I just wanna share with you occasionally, um, not uh, overwhelm you with them, but so here's the road to uh, Colostrata. And here's the bridge. And this bridge was actually, the, the old bridge was there until very, very recently. And actually there's a big picture up there of the, of the old bridge that Francis would have known and that troops were on during the, uh, during the battle. So um, after navigating the last traffic circle, we arrived at Ponte San Giovanni, uh, St. Saint, Saint John Bridge. The driver parked in a clearing west of the river, so across that bridge, and offered to wait while I went to check out the site. Take your time, he said. I thanked him and sauntered over the bridge. The original span was gone, but its ghost remained. I crossed the bridge, conjuring up as I went, what happened here in 1202. The battle's sparse written accounts tell us that the Assisian forces, after easily crossing the valley, and marching on toward Perugia, massed on a hill at Colostrata and then swept down toward the river where they were met by a better trained enemy. And this is where a lot of the battle actually took place. Now it's this very quiet area. Um, some, of the man, some of the Assisi soldiers managed to get onto the bridge while others were stopped in this field along the river's edge. Though the battle is said to have been long and intense, the Perusians decisively overwhelmed the Assisians, cutting them down as they retreated. Quote, there was a great massacre in a war between the citizens of Perugia and Assisi. Thomas of Celano, one of the early biographers of St. Francis uh, wrote, the Perusians sent the blood soaked fleeing for hiding places in the woods and in the caves then hunted them down like animals. Paul Moses wrote in his book, St. Francis and the Sultan, a really great book, by the way, drawing on an account that happened a while after the battle. The battlefield was covered with severed limbs, entrails, and mutilated heads. Not sure what kind of a retreat it is this afternoon to hear this, but in any case, in his book, Francis of Assisi, the former mayor of uh, Assisi, who had access to all the archives of the city, uh, Arnaldo Fortini uh, writes, the sight of those killed on the field 
where the fighting took place was horrifying beyond words. All the fields were covered with the dead. When I was there, when I was in this place right here, this large field opened up to my left as I stepped off the bridge, blanketed with golden wheat or maybe grass. It ran nearly all the way to the river and was bordered to the east by a few sienna hued stone houses you can kind of see there. By design or the quirky vagaries of history, Francis's battlefield was drenched in anonymity. There were no signs, no exhibits, no interpretive center. There was no entrance fee. I think there's a reason we're not focusing on the battlefield uh, that Francis fought in. I was taken with the silence. The no noise from the traffic barely 100 feet off fell away, and I found myself focused and attentive to the mute but charged meanings of this patch of earth, now draped in vegetation where the young of Assisi and Perugia once fell. There was a meaning here, a reality that changed Francis almost instantly, but that he spent the rest of his life teasing out, and most importantly of all, acting on. It is here that the dream of glory, the longing for wealth, and the ready intelligence or, and allegiance to a culture of violence came suddenly crashing to earth. The Nobel laureate Saul Bellow says in his novel, Herzog, truth comes in blows. And here on this obscure patch of ground where a young man blithely committed to his world's violence was dramatically immersed in its logic and characteristic and chaotic finality. The light of truth slowly began to stream through a shattered facade of delusion and righteous self-interest. Whatever else came from this horror show, a stark recalibration of everything beckoned. As placid as this plot of land appeared on this glorious sun-drenched day, it was quietly awash in the half-life of fear and greed and retribution and loss, even after all this time. There were likely many shocks for the young cloth merchant, one stacked on the next. The stubborn reality of medieval combat, the dizzying stench of blood and death, the overwhelming awareness that things had gone absurdly awry, the collapse of a troubadour's chivalric fairy tale revealing what those chivalrous tales really were about, the sudden prospect that his very life was at risk, and then at the end of the day, being rounded up with the other survivors and hauled away to the dark and cramped basement of Perugia's city hall to spend a year in its suspended animation of a medieval dungeon. Francis leaves us no direct testimony about Colostrata and the battle that took place there. The records we have are about, about that afternoon stem from the early biographies drawing on reminiscences of his companions who re re reported presumably on what they had heard from Francis during his time with them. We do know that these sources, uh, we do know from these sources that after being ransomed by his father, Francis was a different person. And this extraordinary change would send him in a radically new direction. The life Francis will come to lead is a rich and complex spiritual journey into the depth and reality of God. This journey will have many facets and will inspire innumerable others to dramatically change course. At the same time, his journey emerge, emerges from a concrete context that will shape his particular approach to, to this voyage into the arms of God. The fact that Francis was a merchant awash in money at a time when money was playing an increasingly prominent role in a society shaped his strict rejection of it. That the growth of cities throughout Italy was chipping away at the undermining of feudalism shaped his decision to reject a monastic life for a life on the road. And that he experienced war shaped a life doggedly marking and making peace. While Francis will not write about this experience, many of the actions and decisions of his subsequent life can be understood most clearly as a way of reckoning with it 
Colostrata would come to spur him on, compelling him to live a profoundly different way, pursuing peace, constructing in fits and starts a life of peace and peacemaking, and gradually recognizing that he could not do this by himself. He couldn't make peace by himself. He had to be with others, and so became a channel for the emergence of a community of peacemakers. The explosive afternoon of death in Colostrata, followed by a year of brooding meditation on its pathos in prison, seems to have utterly reframed the meaning of war for Francis. War is no longer the linchpin of order, a keystone of civilization. It is now a storm of disorder and loss. He had seen it with his own eyes. It brought him up short. He had escaped physical death, but now he seemed to be uh, to have been carrying the cloying power of it within his very being. There was the need for cleansing, but this need seems to have gone beyond individual transformation. A seed of doubt had been planted about a world where war was the norm. Where does someone go with such doubts in the 13th century? In the 21st century, were the heirs of a growing tradition of peace movements, of sensitivity to the crushing aftermath of, com of combat and its trauma, and of widespread skepticism about the morality and effectiveness of war. In Francis's world, there was none of this. In the wake of this war and its brutality, Francis conceivably su suffered from what today is described as post-traumatic stress disorder and moral injury. This term, though popularized during the Vietnam War, applies to veterans of all wars and to survivors of other very traumatic events. While sufferers of PTSD sometimes seek out forms of violence and conflict, in many other cases they seek to avoid conflict. They also demonstrate diminished interest or participation in activities they had previously enjoyed. Often they feel detached from others and withdrawn from the external world, frequently experiencing recurring nightmares, sleeplessness, depression, hopelessness, irritation, and anger. Francis experienced the trauma of war and bore many of the marks of a survivor of war. Dealing with anger was a continual challenge for Francis. In his later years, he suffered from depression. He experienced sleeplessness, nightmares, and dramatic dreams. He even lost interest in things that he had previously enjoyed, including spending time in nature. Common to many people who endure war or imprisonment is survivor's guilt. And this, some of this comes from some writing that our colleague, uh, Father Louis Vitali, has done on this. It is not improbable that Francis's exceptional concerns for the poor were rooted in part in an abiding awareness that the poor Assisians who had fought with him in the war against Perugia had been slaughtered, while he, the son of a rich merchant, had been able to be held for ransom and, in fact, released. An active consciousness of this burden the burden of being given his life back while others had not may have played a role in his abandoning the privilege that had spared his life. This awareness may have provoked a dramatic reversal of his desire for riches, which yielded its opposite, the longing to marry Lady Poverty and to live the fate of the poor themselves. Francis returned from war deeply wounded, but how did he recover? He could have resumed his old life. He could have taken up his previous social revelry. He could, he could seek healing by undertaking traditional religious practices like almsgiving. He could become reclusive. In fact, he did all these things. However, the guilt and blame Francis may have felt did not ebb, no matter how many banquets he attended. Finally, Francis thought the answer might be to go back to war itself. In 1205, he abruptly decided to join a military campaign in southern Italy in support of Emperor Frederick II's claim to the Sicilian throne. However, almost as abruptly, he abandoned this plan after a dream tells him to return uh, to Assisi. One of the early sources, one of the early sources says about this period, he endured great suffering and mental anxiety. A few days later, as a few days passed when, according to the source, while he was walking by the church of San Damiano, he was told in the spirit to go inside for a prayer. San Damiano is about a mile 
uh, south of the city wall of Assisi. You probably passed it many times, probably had given it no uh, thought at all. It was kind of a rundown chapel. Once he entered the rundown chapel, he began to pray intensely before an image of the crucified, which spoke to him in a tender and kind voice. Francis, don't you see that my house is being destroyed? Go then and rebuild it for me. Stunned and trembling, he said, I will do so gladly, gladly, Lord. We know that Francis will forever after revere the wounded Jesus. In fact, Franciscan spirituality will play a large role in shifting medieval piety from a focus on the transcendence of God to the humanity of the God-man Jesus. Perhaps in this critical life-changing moment for Francis, it is as if the crucified Jesus is saying to him, look, See, behold, this is what violence does. This is the reality of cruelty and greed, the truth about the war we are waging against one another. See my wounds, see my hands, my feet, my side. They are the wounds of violence and destruction, but even more, perhaps Jesus was saying to him, this is not the way of God. God is not a, a God of carnage and retaliation, but at the same time, God does not turn away from the carnage. God enters into it, facing the worst vulnerably and walks side by side with all who suffer this horror. God is not vanquished, God is wounded, but God lives. And this living God called Francis to see in an utterly new way the destruction of Colostrato, but also to see the God who was in the midst of that violence. God himself had been attacked at Colostrato and was present in all who suffered there. But Francis also saw that in the midst of this conflagration, God was actively making peace, not by fleeing from the malicious violence, not by dis dispensing soothing words, not by hurling damning judgments, not by favoring one side over another. Jesus with arms outstretched was actively making peace in the war zone by standing in the midst of it and by opening a way through his own wounded body beyond war, beyond destruction, beyond the violence that desecrates the image of God. Commentators on this vignette often stress that while San Damiano no doubt needed to be refurbished, outlying churches in the Italian countryside of that, in that era were often in disrepair. The cross's directive was less about restoring this particular chapel than re renewing the larger institution of the Roman Catholic Church, a perspective Francis would come to later. At the same time, it is reasonable to think that repairing San Damiano, San Damiano itself was the primary focus of this imperative which only later, later would be generalized by Francis's hagiographers and maybe by Francis himself into a divine order to re reform the church universal. One intriguing way that this could be true ties directly to his war experience. In their book, in their 2011 book, In the Spirit of Francis and the Sultan, Catholics and Muslims Working Together for the Common Good, George Dardis and Marvin Crayer Mitch write, Francis began to repair churches, which was one way in those times that military men atoned for their sins on the battlefield. Could it be that Francis, as part of his quest for absolution, none of the other things gave it to him, almsgiving, going off into caves and so on, 
As part of his quest for absolution for what he had seen and done at Colostrata, arrived at San Damiano with this medieval practice in mind, we know that he engaged in a series of ascetical rites in the wake of his war experience. And we also know he, he repaired other churches, including Santa Maria de Angeli. Go repair my church. Go rebuild my church. Francis is overjoyed. It is the closest he has come yet to absolution. Without hesitation, he says, I will do so gladly, Lord. This directive will go far beyond bricks and mortar. The wounded Jesus has responded to the woundedness of Francis with a tender and kind voice and then invites him to heal by healing the church. This encounter revealed the humanness of Jesus with a special focus on his woundedness and the willingness of the divine to face, engage with, and transform the violence in our world. But it goes beyond this. By this act of divine mercy and compassion, Francis has been taught the way of mercy and compassion. This nonviolent action of Jesus shows Francis the way of nonviolent action, which he will engage in endlessly for the rest of his life. The unconditional love of God by which Francis is saved and healed is part of an ongoing training in this way of this love. It also begins to train him in dissolving the sharp boundaries that divide us from good and evil, that divide us into good and evil or righteous and un unworthy. It is impossible to heal violence with, without also asking, what is my part in it? This will become a key dimension to Francis's way of peace and nonviolence. Wrestling with Colostrata illuminated for Francis the role he played in that violence. It will be a root of the compassion he has for the perpetrator of violence going forward. He does not rail against the war makers, the war making of others, as if he had nothing to do with war, as if he were innocent of war. He makes peace knowing that he has made war. And he has learned at San Damiano that absolution is possible for any of us. It is this very exchange it is in this very exchange that the rebuilding of the church has begun, become the possibility of becoming a more nonviolent church. Francis will now begin to take up his new nonviolent life. He will spend the rest of his life crisscrossing Italy and other parts of the world, preaching repentance, which I suggest was bound up with and, and repenting of war and violent conflict. His preaching will always begin with the phrase, may the Lord give you peace, which he says was on, one of only two revelations from God he received in his life. That was one of them, a revelation, this phrase, this greeting, may the Lord give you peace. Francis's spirituality and mission rejected the means of war. For example, Francis insisted that those who joined his circle of peacemakers would abstain from carrying weapons. Over time, this had far-reaching consequences. As former Minister General of the Friars Minor, Herman Shalok noted, he forbade all of his followers to carry weapons. As a result, it became difficult for some feudal lords to muster an army together, as there were so many Franciscan, secular Franciscans who refused to carry arms. This simple demand by Francis helped to collapse the feudal system in Europe, the Minister General said. But Francis's spirituality and mission rejected also the culture that feeds war, including the economic inequality of emergent mercantilism. As he said at one point to his spiritual advisor, Bishop Guido, he has given up all possessions because if he had them, he would have to defend them. He will also turn on its head the troubadour tradition whose songs largely celebrated the war, war and the crusades. He will reject the life his father and family have planned for him. He will go on to build a community of consciously subverting the class hierarchies of his time, where all are now lesser brothers and sisters, not one above another. And the Franciscan tradition will remember a series of specific situations of his peacemaking, which I call Francis's nonviolent actions. <clears throat> 
But before we get on to those actions, let's turn to St. Clair. How did St. Clair become St. Clair? In 1212, Francis was joined in his work by Claire of Assisi. Francis was born into a family that represented one center of power of Assisi life, the emergent mercantile class, while Claire was born into a clan that represented the other, the long established nobility. In tandem, their movement renounced the typical life of the times, served as a complementary and virtually complete rejection of the world of getting, spending, and dominating. But how did this happen? Um, but how did this happen? Maybe the best place to start is to point out the intriguing fact that Chiara Ofredicho, whom we will come to know as St. Clair of Assisi, started out as Francis's enemy. I actually don't see this in many books that make this point. You'll remember the uprising in 1198 I mentioned earlier. This pitted the merchant class against the noble class. Francis was part of the former, while Claire was part of the latter. In fact, her family was exiled to Perugia following that insurrection. And in fact, they were there when the Battle of Colostrata took place and when Francis was put in the dungeon in Perugia for a year. In the end, probably because, probably in part because of the defeat of the Assisians at Colostrata, Claire and her family were able to return to Assisi. I have no evidence that Claire suffered PTSD from the experience of being forced out of their homes, had to be uh, refugees for a time, but it was likely a wrenching experience. She resisted her family's plan for her, that is to marry another noble, and found herself attracted to the message of Francis when she was able to hear him preach in Assisi. She was determined to join his fledgling community and though facing severe opposition for her, from her family, maybe because she's getting in with the enemy, uh, did so. I find this story intriguing, not only in terms of her spirituality and sanctity, but because her actions can be seen as a, a clear repudiation of the structure and commitments of her society. She joins a movement that subverts the class hierarchies of the time, she gives up her wealth, and she symbolically heals the wounds and the enduring social conflict between the nobles and the merchants by not only joining this new band, but joining the band led by her family's former enemy. Though Francis founds the Franciscan Second Order of Women, it is Claire that leads and forms it at San Damiano. She will lead this egalitarian community until her death in 1253, uh, decades after Francis's death in 1226. Now let's turn to some examples of nonviolent action of Claire and Francis, beginning with Francis. So Francis made peace between Assisi's mayor and bishop. He made peace between the warring factions of the city of Arezzo, not too far from Perugia. He made peace with lepers and also with his own brothers. He made peace with the Sultan in Egypt. And it's even said, of course, that he made peace between a hill town and a ravenous wolf. All of these would illuminate Francis's nonviolence. But for today's reflection, I invite us to consider his intervention with a number of bandits in the area of Monte Casale, where a number of his followers lived, that's recounted in one of the early documents called The Deeds of Blessed Francis and His, and his Companions. So, so this is what uh, this uh, early document says. At that time, three famous robbers frequented the area and they committed many evil deeds in the area. One day they came to the area, the place of the brothers and asked brother Angelo, the guardian, to give them something to eat. But the guardian answered them in this way, rebuking them sharply. You robbers and cruel murderers, you aren't ashamed to steal the hard work of others. And now you're bold and shameless enough to try to devour the alms sent to the servants of God. You aren't worth the ground to hold you up. You have no respect for people or the God who created you. Go, mind your own business and never show yourself here again. <laughs> 
At this, they left disturbed and uh, deeply offended. Then St. Francis just happens to appear at that point. And he's got a sack of bread and a small jug of wine that he and his companions had obtained. The guardian tells him this story, thinks he's going to get a medal for tossing these people out. St. Francis rebukes him severely, saying uh, he has acted cruelly. They would be brought back to God more easily by sweetness than by cruel rebukes. Therefore, our teacher, Jesus Christ, whose gospel we have promised to observe, says that it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, and that he did not come to call the just, but to call sinners to repentance. And for that reason, he often ate with them. Therefore, since you have acted against charity and against the holy gospel of Christ, I command you under holy obedience immediately to take this sack of bread and chuck of wine that I obtained and go after them diligently through mountains and valleys until you find them. Then on my behalf, present all this bread and wine to them, then kneel down before them and humbly tell them your fault of being cruel. Then ask them on my behalf not to do evil anymore, but to fear God and not to offend their neighbors. And if they do this, I promise to provide for them in their need and constantly give them food and drink. And when you have told them all these things, return here humbly. And while the guardian went to carry out the command, St. Francis placed himself in prayer and asked God to soften the hearts of these robbers and convert them to penance. The obedient guardian reached them and presented the bread and wine to them and said, what St. Francis had commanded them. And as it pleased God, as these robbers were eating the alms of St. Francis, they began to say to themselves, woe to us, wretched, miserable wretches. We can expect the pain, the hard pains of hell, and we go on robbing our neighbors, beating and wounding them, and we even kill them. You yet we have no remorse of conscience nor fear of God over so many evil deeds and such horrible things as we do. And here comes the holy brother to us who very humbly, humbly tells us his fault for having said a few bad words and uh, rightly because of our wickedness. He has brought us, so brought us bread and wine and the generous promise of the Holy Father. They really are holy brothers of God who deserve the paradise of God. And we are sons of eternal perdition. Who deserve the pains of hell and daily we increase our perdition and we are we don't know if we are able to re return to the mercy of god from the sins we have done up to now and then one of them says what you're saying is really true what should we do the other one says let's go to saint francis and he gives us a slimmer glimmer of hope that we can turn from our sins to the mercy of God, we'll do what he commands, and we can free our souls from the pain, pains of hell. This suggestion pleased the others. And so all three agreed and went quickly to St. Francis and said to him, Father, because of the many horrible sins we have done, we do not believe we can return to the mercy of God. But if you have any hope that God will receive us in his mercy, we're prepared to do what you tell us and to do penance with you. Then St. Francis, receiving them charitably and kindly, encouraging them with many examples and assuring them of the mercy of God, promised them as certain that he would obtain from them from this from God for them, showing them the mercy of God is infinite. And, if, and Francis says, and if we had infinite sins, the divine mercy is still greater than our sins, greater than then the mercy of God is, is infinite. Through these words, the three robbers renounced the demon and his works, and St. Francis received them into the order, and they began to do great penance. So in reflecting on this story, several elements stand out. It's emblematic of a serious concern of pre-modern Europe. How does one maintain peace and security especially outside the walls of the city. The followers of St. Francis are pr pursuing one strategy to deter the robbers who by their own admission have killed people by castigating them and not rewarding their deviant behavior. St. Francis sees things differently. Treating the bandits in, the way, in this way offends the gospel. 
it also does not solve the problem. St. Francis dictates a dramatically different way. Go to these robbers, apologize for your behavior, offer them a peace offering, and then meet the deeper root causes of this breach of the peace, guaranteeing a way to meet the needs of hunger and want. It's interesting to see the robber's response. When they are confronted not with condemnation, but compassion, a kind of spaciousness opens among them for a profound reflection on the actions of the friar, on their own actions, but also on their very deep culpability. They believe that their wickedness has been so egregious that they are lost. Despite that sense of damnation, the nonviolent action of Francis motivates them to return to the community that rejected them and, in, and inquire about this. They tell Francis, we do not believe we can return to the mercy of God. Can you tell us about that? And he says, God's mercy is, even if you have infinite sins, God's mercy is even more infinite, which is a very interesting thought. Um, I am wondering if the first example he gave them was his own experience. They ask him for examples, and it says he gave examples. I wonder if he gave them his own experience of the mercy of God and his own beings forgiven in spite of everything. He knows from his own experience what it is to violate, perhaps even to kill others. This is what I suggest lets him say wholeheartedly, if we have infinite sins, the divine mercy is still greater than our sins. Hearing this, they renounce their evil, and then they become Franciscans, whereupon they begin to do great penance, which I take to mean embark on the journey of transforming the pattern of violence that has been, they have been wreaking on the world and undertaking the conversion to nonviolence as, as Francis has done. So what about Claire? What nonviolence actions can we ruminate on there? Put briefly, St. Claire is one of the great models of nonviolence, whoever lived, as John said earlier. She creates a nonviolent community without distinctions of class or wealth or status, which is a radical departure for religious communities of her time and maybe even our own, the youngest, newer mem newest members had the same right to speak in the weekly meetings as every other sister, where decisions were made by consensus. Like Francis, she believed that the life of the gospel met a radical, holy poverty. She waged a lifelong struggle with the popes of that time to enshrine this commitment to the privilege of poverty in her community's rule, which she received finally the day before she died because of this relentless campaign that she was on. Two public uh, examples of Claire's nonviolent actions come down to us. Facing an attack on San Damiano by Emperor Frederick II's forces, Claire unarmed confronted the attacking army, holding up a pyx carrying the Eucharistic bread at which the army dispersed. Another was a threatened siege of Assisi, which Claire repelled through prayer for the liberation of the city. On the following morning, uh, uh, it is said in one of the writings, the merciful God brought about a happy ending to the trial so that after that, the entire army had been dispersed. The proud man departed the country, uh, departed contrary to his vow and never again disturbed that land. So what are Francis and Claire teaching us? Francis and Claire dramatically revived Jesus's nonviolence. They did this in how they conducted their lives and in their concrete examples of peacemaking. Here are some of the dimensions of their nonviolent orthopraxis that across these eight centuries, they are training us by their example to unleash. The first is acknowledge and seek repentance of our own violence. The second is to recover gospel nonviolence as the core to our identity as persons of faith. The third is to root our nonviolent journey in prayer. The fourth is to be relentlessly persistent. The fifth is to respond to the unmet needs, the unmet needs at the heart of violence. 
The six, use the most powerful language we have at our disposal to respond to violence, our own unarmed bodies. And finally, to rely on the infinite mercy of God, which is greater than our infinite sins. And if we have one more second, um, we probably all know Franciscans, including some in this circle, who have lived this life. I was very intrigued the fact that in Assisi, there is a museum called the Museum of Memory. And it was inspired by a tradition of Franciscan nonviolence that has maintained itself in Assisi. So during World War II, when the Third Reich was rounding up everybody across Italy who were Jewish and sending them off to death camps, the mayor of Assisi and the Franciscans in that area organized an effort to shelter the uh, Jews that were pouring into the city as the, as the allies were coming up the boot of Italy, uh, Jews were, were running. We know that about 1,200 Jews were rounded up in Rome and sent to places like Auschwitz. And uh, there are, there's an amazing, largely untold story about this effort that happened in the 20th century, and um, including uh, the creation of all kinds of fake documents that were done uh, to provide identities which would prevent people from being rounded up and killed. Thousands of people came to, to, uh, to Assisi and were, um, were responded to in this, in this nonviolent way. And there was a recent gathering of, of survivors from that time talking about how they made these uh, fake documents say on this, on this printing press, for example. And here's, here's an example of it. Of course, this is just one of many uh, Franciscan uh, efforts, but I, I love that connection with, um, with, with Assisi. And to trying to, uh, oh, let me do this. There we go. Each of us has a specific injustice or policy or form of injustice and violence we want to see transformed and healed. From white supremacy to the climate crisis, from economic inequity to the rage of war. Just as Pope Francis has inspired at the very beginning of his papacy to explicitly bring the vision and energy of Francis in the name that he chose. We too can bring the Franciscan vision, energy, and practices of nonviolent transformation and healing to the challenges of our day. In doing so, it is possible, is it possible, it, and in doing so, it is perhaps important to ask ourselves and our communities, what is our battle of Colostrata? What is our San Damiano cross? What nonviolent actions for peace and reconciliation have we taken or that we can take? What new nonviolent revolution can we be part of? Even regarding the abysmal attack on Ukraine by Russia, nonviolent actions of all kinds have been happening in Ukraine. In Russia, some 13,000 people have been arrested protesting this war. And here in the US and around the world, uh, there is that kind of action going on. The spirit of Francis and Claire lives on. We all can be infused with the spirit of peace and nonviolence in meeting the great challenges of our day. Thank you. How about a round of applause? Show your hands for our friend Ken. Ken, that was just wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, can you